Well, hello everyone and good morning. Um, I think we'll start the session. It's 11 o'clock um, and good morning and welcome to everyone who's here on person and online. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Christina Anastasi. I am the branch head. I'm a branch head in the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division here at Geoscience Australia. Um, before we begin, I would like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledging their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We here at Geoscience Australia pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. And I'd also like to extend this welcome to the sem to to the um, attendees and the directors and members here of the Wakamura Aboriginal Corporation and Central Desert Native Title Serv Services who have travelled to be with us here today in person. Um, I'm honoured and to have been asked to actually chair this seminar today, which is on culturally grounded mapping for country, traditional ecological knowledge, science and technology, which is going to be presented by Mr. Cato Muir. Now, before Cato joins us, um, I'll just do a bit, of a, a bit of a spiel about what he's presenting and a bit of an introduction for Cato as well. Technological advances in remote sensing, mapping and data acquisition and analysis using new tools like machine learning, artificial intelligence and other digital mapping models are developed from Western world views. Cato is going to provide us and offer us insights into how traditional ecological knowledge contributes to a culturally grounded perspective in country mapping. Geoscience Australia's Exploring for the Future program is proud to welcome Cato and thank him personally for his public contribution to the program's Geoscience Knowledge Sharing Initiative. Now about our speaker. Now Cato Muir is the chair of the Wakamura Aboriginal Corporation. He is also, he's got a lot of a lot of acronyms against his name and against the titles that he works with, but he is also the chair of the Native Title, the National Native Title Council. He's also co-chair of the First Nations Heritage Protection Alliance, which this is in partnership with the Department of Climate Change, Energy and the Environment and Water. And he is also a founding member of the First Nations Clean Energy Network. Cato is also a First Nations Australian artist. He's an anthropologist and an Indigenous rights activist who is based in Lenora, Western Australia. He is a cultural leader and a senior knowledge holder of the Nalia dialect group of the Mantilajara and language. And my apologies here if I've said it all wrong. Um, he is also a native title holder in the Merchantsons by region and Great Victoria, Gibson and Little Sandy Deserts. He, um, Cato also operates a number of businesses, including an Aboriginal art business, technology company, a sandalwood oil factory and a heritage consultancy business. Look, I'd like you all to welcome Cato. He's um, up to the podium here to give us his talk. I'm very interested and I'm sure you all are. Cato, please come and join us and I'll get out of your way. Thank you. Whoa, well done. I'll just get my glasses on so I can actually see what's on the screen. Um, yeah, so just make a uh, the acknowledgements first. So uh, we're with the Manjidata <laughs> Manjidata Ngalia. So Ngalia is a, uh, my particular dialect uh, with my family group, uh, but we're part of the Manjidata Nation, which um, or Manjidata language speaking groups, uh, who are effectively, you know, one of the last. Um, uh, tribal or nomadic peoples to come in contact with uh, white Australia. Um, so acknowledging also the country that we're here in today, which is uh, Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. 
uh, way over on the Kagara side, on the east side of Australia. And um, we're very pleased to be here. So I acknowledge uh, members of my board and also uh, native title holders from the Mandaredi uh, country and um, <clears throat> people in the audience. So thank you all for coming at such short notice. And uh, those of you online, so I'm assuming you can all see uh, us, but uh, I'll take that on trust. <laughs> Very well, and I will speak to uh, the audience in online as well. <laughs> okay, so yeah, they're the acknowledgements, and this is where we come from. So Mandaredi, if you look at the little black map on the um, left of the screen there, and we are the little red dot, the red, red heart of Western Australia. And um, yeah, so it's always interesting when people ask, where do you come from? And usually they're in Perth and they're sort of either up north or uh, out east. And so we are pretty much 200 kilometres. This is so for all you um, geographically uh, inspired people where I think effectively 200 kilometres to the east, southeast of the dead heart of, of the centre of Western Australia. Um, and that's the, uh, that's the determination area. Uh, we were fortunate to finally get gain recognition of our ongoing rights and interests on our country. Um, in 2018. So basically we had acknowledged the rights to, you know, holding our native title over effectively 24,000 square kilometres of uh, territory and coming back onto the land, having that uh, legal uh, position has is the basis on which we then build and move on our other engagements. So the key takeaways I want to have from this session, uh, I've got the grandiose title of technology and cultural mapping and all of those things. Um, and then I realised I'm probably not going to be able to fit in everything that I promised to fit in. But I do refer you at the end to go to a podcast that I did uh, that captures some of the thoughts and the ideas that go into this presentation. And coming out of this session, this seminar, the key uh, takeaways, first is to understand history. So this is a seminar for Geoscience Australia, and it'll be important to understand or get an understanding of and I think, you know, because we get busy, go about our lives very busy, and we don't act, often reflect on how is it that at this moment in time you are at this particular place? What are the circumstances that led to a, you arriving at that location? And that's part of um, what I'll do in this session is to give a little hint of the understanding of some of the history of how we come to be at the point uh, that we are as Manjidarengalia people, but also as to how uh, our engagement with uh, geoscience occurs. One of the fundamental key takeaways is ask first. And many years ago, I was part of a project uh, that brought a number of uh, traditional owners and cultural people into the Australian Heritage Commission and they produced a little booklet called Ask First. Uh, the nature of uh, bureaucracy is a lot of these things get lost and then you go and write another booklet. Um, but I do sort of uh, try and flag these old works that we've done to because uh, the currency is still there and the methods, some of the dynamics might have changed, but uh, always ask first. Design with traditional owners, that's something that's um, uh, becoming more and more uh, 
modus operandi of um, agencies and uh, you know government departments, uh, industry, others uh, designing with traditional owners. And from our perspective, we want to be involved in science and, and technology in the same way as you guys, but also in our way. And so at a in the podcast, you'll hear me ramble on about this a bit, but um, essentially we're, we're dealing with knowledge systems. And uh, the teenager Western science knowledge system is uh, stopped being self-absorbed now, have evolved enough to be non-self-absorbed, and start to look at um, the wisdom of the elders, which uh, Aboriginal knowledge, uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people's knowledge systems uh, fundamentally sort of um, point to, but also there are many other knowledge systems across the world from other cultures and societies. And what I've noticed, you know, the um, the pathways of uh, acquiring knowledge is Western knowledge is um, young, ambitious. It's a teenager in that it uh, knows everything and uh, takes its time before it listens to anyone. And so that's the opportunity that we present is to spend that time of the wisdom of the, the ancient knowledge combining with the uh, wisdom of uh, the new knowledge that's being produced uh, constantly within that methodo meth methodology and framework. And so always, you know, they say when's the best time to start something, it's yesterday or today, and future is now. So they're the key takeaways. <clears throat> And what I thought to do in this session was to go back into our country, where we come from, and just give a share some of the um, insights that we have from our, our part of the world. Uh, and this is one of the key little insights which I find quite interesting, so I thought I'd share this. Uh, there's so many things that we could be talking about, but um, we do come from these biodiverse desert areas. As my uh, cousin Mr Dion Meredith suggests, uh, we come from the desert with a camel with no name. <laughs> I'll keep quiet there. So, four bioregions. This is a, a fascinating little map. You'll see that um, the Mundaredi determination areas in the black and The unusual boundaries are political, administrative sort of jurisdictions. And so we do have a native title claim in this part of the world as well, but uh, for the, that's the full scope of our traditional territories. But uh, here in Mundaredi, you'll see that we're part of the Great Victoria Desert in this region here. Uh, the Carnegie bioregion, which only last week uh, you would have heard that the Waluna Mardo people have gifted the uh, nation portions of their land to be included in uh, National Park and Nature Reserve. And the Carnegie, this is Lake Carnegie here, so uh, part of the Lake Carnegie area is going into a nature reserve. These are places where you get, you know, the charismatic uh, threatened species like uh, night parrots, um, great desert skink, uh, and other, I think there were some additions to threatened species uh, last week as well. So a lot of these um, bioregions out here, are, you know, this is where the pastoral lands end but uh, they're still quite remote and quite um, undeveloped. Great Victoria Desert, Carnegie, a little sandy desert. Um, so Billa 
Bila is uh, pretty much the country, Great Victoria Desert, um, little sandy desert, all the Dali country, a lot of sand hills, uh, Dali, and the Gibson Desert, uh, which is Rerangata. Uh, Rera meaning um, the, the pea, or the gravel, the pea gravel sort of stuff, laterite. So, they're the sort of, um, you know, the framing. And in this country here is pretty much where some of the last of uh, uh, the nomadic people come out of the desert up in the northern part of our country, which is in the Bidi Liberal uh, determination area. That road there is the Gun Barrel Highway. Some of you might have heard of it, uh, put in in the 1950s by the Australian Army. And down here is the Outback Way, which uh, goes from Laverton through to Winton. Um, that was a road put in in the 1920s by, guided by some of our elders who took the missionaries out to uh, set up Warburton. And Chuga Yellow Roadhouse is there. Um, this road here goes by, our track goes by a couple of different names. Um, Originally Eagle Highway, because I think it was Eagle Petroleum that put it in. Um, well, they followed the tracks uh, of one of our elders, uh, Uncle uh, Mickey Wainer, who's long past, but he was one of the last people born at uh, Reddy, Emperor Springs, and he led uh, some people in along this track. Uh, but Europeans also tend to call this uh, the David Carnegie Highway. Um, this is really the only vehicle access into our country. Um, apart from that, the rest of it's, uh, there's some, you know, small exploration tracks there, but it's all largely um, untraversed. So that's where we come from, and just wanted to share, you know, that whole excitement of we've been to this point here, for instance. I don't think many people can say that they've ever been to a point in the ground where you're standing on three different bioregions. Uh, so geek out on that, guys. <laughs> um, so our first contact uh, started in the 18, 1874, uh, John Forrest. Uh, came through, or oh, Sir John Forrest, later the Governor of Lord John Forrest, even um, Governor, uh, not Governor, first Premier of Western Australia. He led uh, led Western Australia to join the Federation, and uh, that's how us West Australians come to be standing with you guys over on this side of the world. Um, through to 1890 is really that early exploration phase. The next big event after that was the 1950s with Len Vidal putting in the Gun Barrel Highway and those sort of uh, army survey, survey, surveying access tracks as part of the Woomera um, rocket tests. So they started uh, the European mapping of our country. Here's a image taken from John Forrest's uh, travels. And he mounted a couple of expeditions into this area. Uh, one of his very first expeditions out into the Goldfields region was uh, looking for uh, Leichhardt. Um, so as you all know, Leichhardt got lost and no one knows where Leichhardt and his 10,000 sheep ended up. Um, but uh, there's always these stories about, uh, you know, remains of a white man out in the desert, etc. And so that was uh, Forrest's first expeditions, but then as he uh, got into the groove, he mounted a number of expeditions across into our country. So uh, naming places, I'll, I'll focus on these places here, which is just to the side of Mandaredi. Um, I think in here he's got a fame range. So horse fame abandoned here, and that poor old horse has immortalised in the name of a range on Mundaredi country called Fame Range. Um, 
what you see here, though, is the descriptions, because exploration is all about identifying places and products that might be of use to uh, something or someone. And here we have miserable sand ridge covered with spinifex. <laughs> um, far as can be seen to the south, the country is covered with spinifex, thinly wooded with mulga. How times have changed? Because these places are now, you know, ideal locations for nature repair credits or um, ideal locations for petroleum exploration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the, they're the um, observations, because in those days what he's looking for is or auriferous ground and good grass. And uh, Alexander Spring, or Dirin as we call it, became a focal point for all the explorers who came into this part of the desert because Forrest named this uh, spring after his brother, Alexander. And he, um, he was so excited about it. I think there's a, oh, I can't see the reference here, but uh, he thought it was a, an actual spring that uh, produced water. And so everyone like uh, Hube from South Australia, a German descent explorer who was sent across uh, from South Australia with instructions not to sink any wells in Western Australia. Um, he went to uh, Alexander Springs and everyone bar Forrest had found it dry. Um, anyway, I'll move on from that map. That's just showing you. Uh, oh, one of the interesting points here though, just as, a, as an aside, a lot of Forrest's journeys were supported and guided by an Aboriginal man called Tom, Tommy Windich. Tommy Windich was a Noongar man from down the southwest. And in much of the areas that he'd travel, uh, Windich was able to negotiate safe passage. So when you see these Aboriginal guides there, they're actually um, ambassadors, they're negotiators, and they're the people who ensured the success of these expeditions. And so in forest journals, you'll find that when they got to this part of the world, Windage was outside of his uh, influence, social influence. And the party came under attack. Uh, they observed burial practices which they had not understood or seen before. So it was a boundary, you know, a, a real cultural boundary. Um, and yeah, further along, if you follow this map, you'll see that they ended up being attacked by the Ngāniadara and Ngāniadara people further east as well. The other explorer was the honorary Sir David Carnegie, who some of you may have heard of. Uh, he ultimately met his demise in a war with a king in Africa, um, but he was the uh, Lord I think. Anyway, can't remember the details. But uh, David Carnegie spent some time in the Goldfields region. You'll see the party that he went with, Bredon. So Bredon's name appears everywhere. Massey. Massey's name appears everywhere. Stansmore even has a map named after him. And Worry, I think, has a map named after him. So these are, and which is all stuff that comes back to you guys, because I think you guys do all the mapping, uh, naming of those maps, uh, Geoscience Australia. So, David Carnegie, I'll just show a quick little video of um, where he went, and I'll try and stop, pause at a few locations. So, this is a map you can get from Trove. Uh, I'll pause it here because there's a good little, on the map here, it's not in detail, but there's a line that he calls the settlement line. And the settlement line is something that's still quite relevant today, and it's a very big part of where we as Mandaragnalia or Mandaredi native title holders, because our country is on the eastern side of that settlement line. And the settlement line essentially is the frontier. The frontier of Australia um, 
was mapped here in the 1890s, and it largely remained there, probably, I would say, up until the discovery of the Tropicana gold mine and the um, Gruyere gold mine, and now the West Musgraves, which is uh, BHP has just purchased of Oz Minerals, is moving development interests into the desert. And that's essentially why we're here to uh, talk and have uh, relationships with Geoscience Australia, because you guys facilitate a lot of that access. Um, so you can see in archival records how uh, these old maps, I mean, it's not clear here, but you can get a copy from Trove, like I say, uh, these old maps tell those stories. That's the broader uh, map of uh, his journey and into our country. Um, which I will move across to the PowerPoint again. And you'll see Breddon's Bluff, Emperor Springs. Uh, we've just uh, enjoyed the coronation of yet another monarch, but um, Empress Springs is named after Queen Victoria. Um, that Empress Springs is our main place, which is uh, ready. And I'll show you some slides on that. And this is the journeys that uh, David Carnegie went on. Uh, Dedin is here, Alexander Springs, and a bit further on is a place called Mangali up here, which is our main places, Mangali, Dedin, and Redi. Emperor Springs was uh, famous because David Carnegie and co, his party, had run out of water. And how they found water was to capture one of our old ancestors and tie him up and feed him with salt beef uh, until he got thirsty and he led, well, he led them to a place called Malandala. And in our dreaming stories, this is a place that doesn't have much water, Malandala. Um, and at Malandala, the old fellow was pretty close to Reddy, but Reddy was a guarded secret. And uh, there was a, in, if you read David Carnegie's book, uh, Spinifex and Sand, uh, he talks about how he, um, the elder, oh, the old, you know, one, our ancestor sought to escape and he ran, ran away and they all tackled him, dived on him and kept, kept him there in camp until he too was as thirsty as they were, and so led them to uh, Reddy, Emperor Springs, which is pretty much, you know, a nondescript uh, limestone uh, area, but you go down into the cavern and the water is uh, down at the base. And you can see here they extracted some 10, 10 gallons uh, from, the, from the spring. So that's, the first sort of um, representations of uh, Reddy in uh, European record. We note these three trees up here. So Carnegie was there in 1890 or thereabouts. Uh, when my parents first visited again, because Empress Springs was sort of, uh, no one had been there until again in the 1970s. In the 1970s, one of these trees was still standing and another had fallen. So of those three trees, they were still there, um, you know, 70, 80 years later, which that tells you stuff, doesn't it? It tells you about um, what's happening in the ecology and despite bushfires and stuff like that, some of these uh, old trees remain uh, integral part of the landscape. And they're also an integral part of uh, the cultural landscape we have. So that's the representation there. This is how we see uh, these places. I've, um, 
a painting by my mother on the left, which is it left? Your left? Yep, my right. Uh, that's of Reddy, Empress Springs, and our logo, the Wagamoto Aboriginal Corporation. We continue to keep the uh, three trees there, and this is Reddy. That's uh, my Lino Cups uh, design. So I won't go into it, but there's a whole discussion that you could have about paintings and artwork and how they re reflect our understanding of country and our mapping of country. Uh, but that's another discussion for another time. Grammar, be very careful of grammar. Um, on this slide, I have what not to do, engage with traditional owners properly. <laughs> so that's a subtext. What not to do, full stop, you must engage with traditional owners properly. So for all of you guys online there, please be mindful of that. <laughs> And this is our, just a little story, little yarn of how uh, our, so in the history, that's where John Forrest, David Carnegie and others have been mapping and documenting our country. Today, that process is ongoing, mapping and documenting of our country, um, but we would rather not eat salt beef, thank you very much. I'm a vegetarian, so that would be doubly offensive to me. Um, so yeah, hope you haven't catered salt beef for lunch. No. Thank you. Cancelling. Cancelling it now. Good, good. Um, not our artwork, but I thought this would be uh, part. Of, it comes from an exhibition, uh, a past elder, um, whose art rep was to make the statement, "Map, map, we are." Um, this seems to be a theme that comes out from a few artistic uh, endeavours. I think the um, Mardu people also had a exhibition and there's a website you can find, we don't need a map. And the statement is uh, about if you're really mapping country, you're going out there, you don't, you're, you're essentially a foreigner, you're an outsider and you're coming in to assert an interest or a claim on country. You give it names, you uh, design it and draw it. And so here, this elder, um, so that's really good country. That's our country. This is better than it was, so sorry if I get it wrong, but Mabawea Budimana. Um, but anyway, I won't read any more of that, but basically what he's saying, it's our country. And I think the dialogue or the conversation that a lot of um, traditional owners of a country are saying, when we're mapping country, we need to be part of that. Otherwise, your map becomes a foreign object. So, what not to do? Do not construct on sacred sites. That's one thing. And so here we have a cause repeater. I think you guys were in partnership with uh, Landgate in Western Australia in uh, putting this at the top of Mount Leonora which is a sacred site. Um, we as a community there were, uh, I wouldn't say mortally, but uh, horribly offended by it and uh, sought to have it removed. And it was just a clear case of, um, you know, that little box, list of boxes that you tick, maybe have one in there, ask first. Um, ask a second time, uh, don't do the uh, phone call to the office and no one answers, so you go and put in a multinational gas and oil facility, um, which is an aside of some recent court case uh, up in the north of Australia. 
Um, so this installation was very good. Uh, they moved it and then we decided, okay, well, let's go and paint it. Um, And there it is. So that's a, um, a cause repeater station. Um, whoa, Grammarly Go can go. I was not expecting that. Right. Um, so if you Ask first, you get in there and you talk, um, we can all be happy ways. You guys are doing your own dot paintings, by the looks of it. <laughs> and you have a number of these uh, facilities all across Australia. And uh, those of us who've been in, you know, Aboriginal heritage surveys and those sort of things, we have suffered the consequences of uh, poor mapping and uh, what do they call it, the uh, buffer, two, three metre buffer or dis dispersion on uh, reference points and had um, sites bulldozed by miners because the GPS said it's okay. And so we really understand the need to have centimetre level precision, uh, which is what uh, you're doing. Um, this is where we are at Leenora, uh, I think Kalgoorlie, and gee, you must need a lot of signal down this way, but uh, not a lot up that way. With that signal. So very much aware of these sort of things and the role and the importance. And this is going to be more and more important as uh, Aboriginal ranger groups, uh, cultural heritage legislation, you know, there are actual Western Australia at the moment, there are actual penalties, million dollar penalties for destroying sites. So if you don't have your mapping right, uh, there could be some liabilities that uh, you can't say you were not aware of. Um, the West Australian version of that map is uh, the geodetic strategy. And you can see here that our little uh, facility ended up on their um, strategy document. And it was a positive experience that we went through there, despite the fact that they had desecrated the site initially. We've managed to take it away from the site, build it down near the, um, the airstrip where all the radio uh, telemetry sort of uh, facilities are located. And they were able to then go back and engage more closely with other traditional owners as they were building a lot of these um, cause facilities through the state. The little dots in the background there, for those who don't know, they're benchmark sites. And so the surveying of country is ongoing. The um, I, you know location of these plaques uh, well have largely occurred. And this is the uh, Mundaredi country in here. We don't have that there yet. I wonder what happened. So geoscience, why have we not built a cause facility out on our country? But anyway, so that's maybe something that we can talk about a bit further, because this is the thing. It's about the partnership where for a lot of traditional owner groups and 
I didn't show the map, but all of this country out here is pretty much exclusive possession native title land today. And traditional owners need to have access to the data, the information, just the same as a resource company or anyone else. And that's the um, opportunity I think that's presented today. So make contact, get in touch, just ask. Uh, this is the, you know, hopefully um, you guys don't mind us showing this stuff, but this is where how the contact with our PBC occurred. Um, these notices coming through and we're going, what, um, aren't you guys helping miners? And that's going to be the first question for a lot of uh, traditional owners out there. Uh, that was the recent sort of um, AeroMag surveys. And we wrote back with uh, some of our concerns, not uh, extensive, but uh, some of them, one of which was a low flying aircraft at a particular time of the year. We're going into emu nesting seasons around about now. They were proposing to do that. Um, after Australia lost the war against emus um, in, what, when was it, 1920? No, 31, was it? Um, sadly, though, in our country, we don't see many emus anymore. And uh, so that's something that we're really concerned about is we know that they breed out in these remote areas. And so these kind of activities uh, we want to be able to make sure that they, they occur in um, in convenient windows of time uh, for our land to be able to continue going about its business. And then, of course, data and access concerns. Uh, that's one of the big um, topics in Australia and probably all over the world is this whole idea of data sovereignty and accessing data and um, who uses it. There's a lot of commercial application of data, as you know, um, and that's a key concern that uh, we need to have a dialogue or a conversation around and set up some uh, rules and values, I suppose. It's, uh, it's probably more about the values and the principles that, you, that go into it as opposed to the rules, because rules are often navigated around. Uh, this was uh, published on LinkedIn a few weeks back, and um, Mandaredi country is in here. So we do have, and I noticed this and I'm going, oh, why did the APY mob not Anangu Pitinjara, Yangonjara people uh, seems to have chosen not to let you guys fly over their country. Um, and I don't know, it may be some administrative thing about South Australia also. But uh, uh, So this is the hot new bit of data that's off the press. And this is the conversation I'm pretty sure all of these traditional owners in exclusive possession native title lands in particular, where development is measured through uh, land access agreements and stuff like that, that's a conversation they'd want to have with Geoscience Australia and also any corporates that are seeking to access that data and use it for their own purposes. Um, so yeah, need new ways of engaging. Potential impacts of projects, uh, be aware, not all it seems. So that's just showing you where we're situated at this point in time. Uh, our country, 24,000 square kilometres, is about 2,000 square kilometres with mining tenure. There's a few petroleum leases uh, planned in this part of the world as well. And our priority is we want to maintain the ecological integrity of our country, uh, the, you know, the nature and the cultural integrity and the experience. So being on this land is possibly one of the most remotest locations you can get to in, in Australia. Um, as we say, there was only one track in and one track out, and uh, we sort of police and guard that quite uh, passionately. So this map shows you 
new exploration licenses in blue and existing exploration licenses. So when we get into analysing geoscience data, you will find that this here pops up like a big um, red zone. Uh, so prospective mineral activities. And so that's the sort of uh, conversations that we need to be able to have is how do we manage that um, interaction in a way that's uh, respectful, meets the, you know, uh, aligns with the values, and then possibly then go into looking at, you know, the greater benefit of mankind if you need another silver spoon. Not only mining, we see other people coming in. So tracking, tracking what people have done by their foot, digital footprints. So here's a conservation group who've come out and they've identified, um, you know, observations and documentation of uh, certain species. Uh, and you can see that's like no accident, that's pretty much up the track. Um, and so want to be able to have these conversations with people. It's not saying don't not to do it, but it's to say, let's uh, talk about it because some of these species are culturally significant. I'm personally actually involved in a bit of a um, uh, dispute down here because we've got great desert skink population and other uh, threatened species in there that uh, may be impacted by mining and development activities. So, Mapping tells a story and it's let others know what we hold, what's on our country. We know what's there. Uh, we've got, you know, 60,000 years worth of uh, observation, interpretation, analysis. So traditional knowledge is not just about, you know, the skin you see on the surface. We have a depth to it. And in that depth, we understand geological processes. We understand the movement of the waters under the earth. We understand all of those sort of things. The troglofauna uh, species that exist under there. So there, and that's the, when you go listen to my podcast, you'll hear me talk about um, uh, the, the fact that Western science has moved away from spiritual grounding as a way of un understanding the world, whereas our dreaming Tugurva, the Dreamtime stories, is firmly rooted in that spiritual understanding. And then we celebrate and understand the world from there. So on the left, you see John Forrest mapping there. This is the geological survey in WA and geoscience. I can't see the lines on there, but the flight lines flown and the flight lines yet to be flown. Um, oh, there they're yet to be flown which have now been done. There you go, I worked it out. I was going, there's nothing on this map, but yes, the black line. You'll always look at the legend, don't you? So one of the things I said in a seminar, online seminar by TURN, uh, what does that stand for, the anachronism, not the bird, the um, terrestrial e ter network. network, yeah. Uh, environment, there's terrestrial, terrestrial Environmental Research Network, is that? Yeah. So TURN did a great seminar the other day on um, mapping country and uh, the Victorian Coastal Management Plan. Uh, and they gave a good presentation about the engagement with traditional owners. Problem I had with it is the engagement with traditional owners is, it's not the traditional owners project. It's, so always you've got to follow the money trail where who's purchasing this service, this uh, product, who's developing it. And more often than not, it's not traditional owners that are doing that or driving that because we don't have access to the resources. All the resources are locked up a few k's down the road here and they divvy it out to you guys. And you guys go off and uh, divvy it out to other guys in universities or whatever. And um, then as the box at the bottom of the tick is engaged with traditional owners. And so 
the two things I'm saying here, one is ask first. So if you're going down that path, ask first. The other better picture is, hey, come and talk to us about a project that we might want to do. And that's the, you come and look at a Tilgurbaikanyira project. Hands up, anyone want to do that? Um, Kabi Manda Ngorarakanyira. Mai Koga Yanangago. Kolilgo Nindilgo Palyalgo. Kolilgo Listen. Nindilgo is show or acquire knowledge and Palyalgo do it. Um, and Kadonga and Chodanga, up and above. Kado, Choda are what's underneath. Kabi, Manda, so Manda is land, Ngorara, earth, water, Kabi, Kanyara is holding. So what we and most, a lot of traditional owners are, we're those custodians for the essences of life, but also the essence of the earth. And that's um, probably, uh, you know, the primary method of economic participation to date is extractivism. So it's extracting with little regard for the consequences. And so the contributions that traditional owners will be able to have once you understand and get back into our terminology is that it doesn't have to be um, a net, you know, loss sort of activity. You can still extract, but you do it in ways that replenish and revive and support and enhance. And they're the sort of things that we have been doing on this continent for many thousands of years through various climate change events and all that sort of stuff is we know how to survive on this land and do it in a way that enhances uh, all our lives, the species that live there coexist with us, as well as the integrity of uh, landscape processes. Um, there are other emerging technologies. Uh, I'll put these slides up because I've just um, acquired some of these myself. So uh, my company's working with this uh, crew on being able to geofence exclusion areas. Um, so taking cultural heritage management plans, environmentally sensitive areas, geofencing it so when there's uh, development activities going on, we're able to monitor who's going on there, what they're doing, how they're doing it. I dipped in my pocket and bought a couple of these because Coburn and I, my son and I were out bush the other day and I could hear this noise and I'll Try and do it justice. It goes like this. Anyone know what that is? Well, I thought it was a monster. <laughs> and I sat, we sat there, so we were sort of like, our swags were rolled out. We was, um, <laughs> my daughter was already asleep. So we were there going, hmm. That's not a camel, not a dingo. What is that noise? And um, before I panicked and left because I thought it might have been a monster, a, a thought came to my head. There's a word, the name we have for a particular animal, and it's uh, it's kanadogor. Ah, kanadogor. That's a kanadogor. And kanadogor, kana is like wake all night. Dogor is this noise, Kanadogor. And the little creature that's called a Kanadogor is a male busted turkey. So we're coming into breeding season. Um, you look at this emu in the sky, you can see he's moving around, getting ready for breeding time. So turkeys and emus are out there ready for breeding. And that's the conversation we're having. Oh, I wish I could record that sound. So. Um, an audio moth. Just uh, acquired a few audio moths and next time we're out on country we'll set them up and uh, hopefully capture some of the sounds of the night uh, and with the various birds. And then a um, drone 
uh, to help with our mapping. And that's where I think some of the um, engagements, Starlink being quite critical to a lot of these things, of course, um, but a lot of the engagement is about, um, and you see a lot of ranger groups are doing this, uh, getting out, uh, you guys provide the big picture satellite resolutions, but a drone will get you down, especially with the uh, LIDAR and stuff like that, that we're uh, acquiring through our cameras, is to be able to identify pinpoint right on the ground. That's the framing. So you see the uh, you have these uh, benchmarks, geodetic uh, reference stations, all those sort of things. And then in terms of our ability to work on country, we can get down to uh, the borough or the plant and uh, contribute then, I think, to the um, knowledge of all of us, uh, but uh, doing it through processes that reflect the ways that we come at these things. So that's about it. Um, I did come up with this little term, carta nullius, uh, which is a play on the terra nullius idea of, of being left out of cartography. Um, you can find that episode 34 on my Culture Story podcast. And if you want to connect with me, LinkedIn is probably the best way. Um, Kato Muir uh, at LinkedIn. Go well. My coffee's cold, by the way. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>